Hello brothers and sisters. I want to welcome you again on behalf of Elm Springs United Methodist Church. Today I've chosen to be here in the chapel once again as a, as a reminder of this sacred time in this special place. Today is Good Friday. Uh, in a lot of ways it's one of the most important days in the Christian year. But there's more to it than just being mournful and being somber. It should be for us what they say is a full stop. I don't know, many of you have probably already been doing that quite a bit in your own lives uh, as we deal with the COVID-19, uh, we, as we try to do our best with social distancing. It's one of those full stop things where we have to completely stop and set apart some time. Good Friday is a great time to do that. And we can, we can fast from a meal or two. Maybe we can fast most of the day and spend more time in prayer. Perhaps we can fast from social media today, not get caught up in, in all the political rancor and all the finger pointing and all the animosity and all the gossip and all the hearsay that kind of ends up being the, the lifeblood of Facebook and social media. Perhaps we can just change our daily rhythm today. Maybe we can stop for a moment and do something where we stop and listen quietly to a hymn or a song of meditation. Or maybe we use the One Minute Pause app and, and really set aside some time, five minutes or ten minutes, to, to really be in contemplation of who God is and what He has done for us. So whatever you choose to do today, I hope that you will make this time special. And thank you for using this worship time together online uh, to begin this process on Good Friday. Would you pray with me as we begin our time together? Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, and to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Would you continue with me and maybe grab your Bible or look up these verses on your tablet or on your phone? We're going to read from Isaiah 52, verses 13, all the way through to Isaiah 53, verse 12. So please follow along with me if you would. See, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. And he will startle many nations. Kings will stand speechless in his presence, for they will see what they had not been told. They will understand what they had not heard about. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave 
but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier, because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Well, just like yesterday's reading from Exodus, there's more messianic language here, more of this Jesus save us, this, this language of crying out to one who can redeem and make whole and fix what is broken. The prophet Isaiah had in mind the whole people of Israel, though, as, as he was kind of leaning into these descriptions, as he was kind of thinking about what this might actually be like for exiled Israel. And surely there was hope that their exiled humiliation and their shame and, and the disgrace, that they would be redeemed, that the injustice that had been levied against them would finally be made right, that God's hand of justice, God's hand of righteousness would come down and fix what was broken and free them from their oppressors. But within that, we also see the vision of Jesus. And we think about what Good Friday means and the brutal treatment, the harsh punishment, the sacrifice and the wounds that Jesus bore on our behalf. And it's a humbling, sobering thought. And so we turn our attention to Luke's account of that Good Friday, that first Good Friday where Jesus went through the pain, went through the suffering, went through the agony that he endured for us. So we'll be hearing uh, the scripture reading from Luke chapter 22, 39, all the way through Luke chapter 23, verse 54. Just close your eyes and listen if you would, or watch some of the images on the screen as we recount that story of what happened on that first Good Friday. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? he asked them. Get up and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, when darkness reigns. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy! Who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Christ, they said, tell us. 
Jesus answered, If I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You are right in saying, I am. And then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learnt that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us, as you can see. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore I will punish him and then release him. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them. Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts they insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. 
The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Those are powerful, painful words to hear. It's difficult to recall and understand in any way, shape, or form what Jesus' suffering must have been like on that day. But Jesus Christ is this paradox that we see in so many ways. We hear the echoes of it from Isaiah now carried into John, where by Jesus' wounds we have been healed, where the paradoxes continue as he is arrested, yet when he speaks the soldiers fall down. He is tried, yet he is the king and the son of man. He is thirsty and dying, yet he is the source of the spirit, of water, living water, and has shed blood that heals us. And then finally, in the closing of that account, he is buried, but he is buried in a garden. And all these, all these combine together to tell us that God shares our sorrow. He understands where we are, and he meets us in these most difficult places. And I think you have to grab a hold also of the fact that even in this suffering, even in this death, even in the darkness of Good Friday, we find the seeds of hope in the resurrection. And it's with that seed of hope that we conclude our time together here today.